Hello, and welcome to our week on curriculum, teaching, and learning. I'm so glad today to have Dr. Carrie Weaver join me from the University of Waterloo. Waterloo is about two hours west of Toronto, and it is a high STEM institution, also known for its co-op programs. Um, so Carrie, thank you so much for coming. How long have you been at Waterloo? So I just finished my sixth year at the University of Waterloo. That's awesome. And tell us what your title is there. So I am the learning, teaching, and instructional design librarian. Um, so I oversee all of the educational functions of the university library system and support faculty and students across all six of our faculties at the institution um, with teaching and learning functions specifically related to information research and research methods. And I and you and I earlier were just chatting about this idea of this paradigm shift that we're not uh, we're not sort of satisfied anymore with just large lectures of a thousand people and the professor transmitting information to the students. Um, so how are you seeing that shift the way that you do your work? And of course, this class is recurring issues. So what are some of the recurring issues you're facing as you try and unroll different types of pedagogy? So I'm seeing a lot of different concerns. One of the biggest challenges that I've really noted, um, especially coming out of the emergency remote teaching period of the COVID-19 pandemic, is that we're seeing a lot of students with documented accommodation needs and a lot of students who um, don't necessarily want to go through the process of having documented accommodations. But if we can just be honest, we've all experienced something fairly traumatic. Um, and I think one of the big challenges or paradigm shifts that we're seeing is that there's becoming an increasing awareness within the higher edu education landscape that students don't come to us um, just sort of as a clean slate. Um, and this is definitely something that has been recognized um, when we look at theories of adult learning, for example, where we acknowledge that adult learners come into our spaces with prior experience and knowledge. Um, but there's definitely an increasing awareness in the higher education landscape and at Waterloo specifically that um, when people are experiencing things like housing insecurity or maybe they've experienced loss because of illness um, or maybe they're struggling with after effects of a COVID infection that's um, you know, a long COVID infection that's impacting how they're processing information and thinking through things or how quickly they can work on something, that all of these things actually impact students. And so I see that going in two directions. Um, one, in the classroom, I see a real focus on discussing the idea and the concept of universal design for learning and thinking about how we can give students um, who are coming from all of these different backgrounds and experiences with all of these different needs, more flexibility, more ways to demonstrate their learning, um, and to think about how we can help keep them motivated more effectively when there's, I think, a lot more noise um, outside of the learning environment that's really impacting students. Um, and we're seeing this in my role in the library. We actually have seen a total change in student behaviors on campus um, in the pre-pandemic and post-pandemic period where um, it used to be that, you know, maybe students would pop into the library if they needed some something or they needed some space um, and they happen to be on campus. But now what we're seeing is actually students are coming to us from farther away. Um, and so they're actually staying in the library and doing a lot more work in the library and are looking for spaces to do online or blended learning increasingly um, on campus because they might be taking one or two online or blended classes in addition to in-person classes that they're traveling to campus for. So 
there's the focus on universal design for learning, and that's really in the classroom space. On a co-curricular level, we're seeing a lot more focus on student wellness um, and trying to think about how to incorporate ideas of student wellness and make sure that students are aware of wellness supports around and beyond campus actually um, to help support them as they're managing all of these you know sort of noisy issues um, and we're also seeing um, things like the student food pantry um, receive higher levels of use and so forth so it's mental health, it's physical health wellness where supports are needed. And actually in response to that um, at the University of Waterloo in our online learning management system, we recently, um, when I say recently, I mean within the past couple of years, um, have made a move to incorporate a student wellness um, widget that actually just stays at the top um, left hand side of the screen for every student in every class in that learning management system environment um, so that every single time that students are accessing the online components of their courses, they are reminded and have access to some of that student wellness information. So that's been a particularly interesting aspect because student wellness when I started 18 years ago in higher education was not something that was ever was discussed not or something considered. we talked about yeah. say that and pronouns we just it was not on our radar 18 years ago absolutely not and you know even eight or ten years ago pronouns just as an example were just it, it wasn't even possible in a lot of cases to make adjustments within the systems that were being used in higher education. So, um, you know. And, yeah, and I give that example because it's student focused, right? It's actually saying, yeah. let's listen to our student population who are the majority of members at this institution that we run and say, what is it you need in your student experience? And so when you do that with anything like whether it's wellness, whether it's pronouns, whether it's um, acknowledging the learning challenges and making sure they have accommodations. You're dealing with um, students sort of advocating in some ways for students, uh, but you're also dealing with faculty who may have been at the university significantly longer than 18 years. Yes. And so what are the tensions? So what, what I would say, what priorities do faculty have that may conflict with the way that students wanna see a classroom run? So I would say one of the big tensions, uh, especially at an institution like Waterloo, that is a large research focused institution is just that a lot of the faculty were not really hired for their teaching prowess or interest. They were hired for their research background. Um, and as much as the institution tries to offer support and certainly does look at teaching and evidence of teaching as part of promotion and tenure processes, um, the reality is for faculty, the research ends up being the most important part of what they're doing in their work, um, because it's the thing that gets rewarded the most. Um, and this is something that is, I think, particularly attention at larger, more research focused institutions. But in my experience, having worked in my career at smaller, more teaching focused institutions, as well as larger research focused institutions, it's becoming an increasing tension across the higher education sector, um, where more research is being expected, even at more teaching focused institutions and campuses. The, the type of research that's being conducted looks a little bit different um, at the more teaching focused institutions and the more research focused institutions. Um, I think particularly the culture of Waterloo is interesting because also the STEM focus of the institution really colors some of that um, 
some of that cultural aspect um, where maybe teaching isn't quite as highly valued. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating interplay as well, where a lot of faculty members really learned to teach based on however they were taught, which tends to be very traditional sage on the stage lecture based models. Um, and the, so we kind of have a system that ends up perpetuating people moving into the professorate who are successful learning in that kind of paradigm. Um, and then they just sort of repeat it. And the only time that you really see people sort of breaking out of that, um, or the, I should say, the majority of the time that I see people actually breaking out of that are interestingly enough, if they get to the place where they're looking at doing research that includes a teaching and learning component. So they're seeing that students are really struggling with something um, and they'd like to make changes to the classroom um, delivery method or approach, and they'd like to study it. And it's actually the research component and that sort of approach um, that kind of research, classroom-based research in teaching and learning is often referred to as scholarship of teaching and learning or SOTL, SOTL. There's some disagreement about how we refer to it. Um, but it's interesting that especially at this larger, more research-focused institution, the thing that I see sort of helping faculty get over that hump and maybe move in a different direction is when they're actually engaging their interest in research to move in that direction um, as opposed to sort of a more pure like I wonder what would happen if I tried a different approach or a different method of teaching so the interest in experimentation is very much focused on the in the research direction and sort of much less in teaching for teaching's sake I guess I would say. I think that's such an interesting sort of uh, insight. We have people who work in a, a research paradigm. So if we let them get into the social research, suddenly they begin to expand the way they view their teaching. And I think how natural would that, that makes so much sense, right? It's in, in some ways it feels like common sense, but something we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have seen. I would have been like, let's get programs. Let's make sure they do workshops and trainings and to say, actually join us in our research. And then you'll be able to sort of own this change that you're trying to make in your classrooms. So interesting. So as I do have a question then about STEM classes. What inspiring new pedagogies are you seeing in the STEM world for people who are trying to get out of this paradigm shift where I lectured or I, I did well with lectures, that's what I was taught, and now I lecture. Um, for people who are jumping out of that, what exciting things are you seeing? So I would say probably the most successful exciting things that I see are some of the folks in the STEM fields who are really committing heavily to flipped classroom models. Um, and they're able to do that because there has been a lot of progress in um, things like virtual lab supports from some major publishers. Um, there's a really fascinating, our students who um, in the sciences have to take anatomy and physiology courses. We actually have um, available to them an interactive virtual human body um, that they can use and actually do work ahead before they're going to do practical elements of anatomy and physiology um, in the lab space. So I'm seeing a lot of movement that way. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of interest, interestingly, um, in really taking advantage of open educational resources um, from STEM faculty as a way to extend the learning. So maybe they're not going to change the actual pedagogy that they're using in the classroom, but they're looking around to find interactive, open educational components that they can provide to students. So if maybe the lecture didn't work, perhaps this game might work to teach you about chemical compositions, or perhaps um, this 
interactive module might be helpful. And so it might not be something that I'm going to cover any differently in the classroom, but in sort of a universal design for learning approach, I'm going to offer different ways of presenting the information as options for students to help extend um, and diversify what's available. So, um, and I think that that's helpful just from a, a there is a lot of STEM learning, especially in the first couple of years of STEM programs, that's really a lot of memorizing pretty basic concepts. Like you're not going to be an electrical engineer unless you really understand how circuits work. And you're just going to have to spend some time working out circuits and circuitry. Um, and that's going to be essential to the more advanced concepts that you'll hopefully get to later. Um, but they're not going to allow you to progress until it's really clear that you have a strong understanding of circuits. So with that being the case, a focus in those first couple of years on really giving students opportunities to interact with the content in a variety of fashions can be particularly helpful um, to increasing student success. So I love that. I love that you've just touched on some of the big debates, like what role does memorizing still have, right? And then when we have um, actual sort of competencies that need to come out of programming, how can we ensure that those are happening if we're taking our classrooms and making them these creative dynamic spaces? Everyone else thinks that we're like, I don't know, having dance parties in our classes. We're not actually, but there's this debate between how we, how we teach students, right? Yeah, there, there is a huge debate and it, I, to be quite honest, I have seen this debate rage for the entire time I've worked in higher education. I expect to see it continue. Um, but I would say the the one thing that I see sort of routinely that does encourage people, um, even in fields where they feel very strongly like they have content that must be memorized, that is essential, that students cannot progress until they have mastery of the certain content. Um, generally, if they incorporate a, a wider variety of teaching methods or some additional options like the use of open educational resources, um, to help students engage with that content that they feel is so essential, they will see better student outcomes. And, um, you know, this is actually one of the things is that sort of traditionally in higher education, and even around the time that I started my career in the field, um, it was sort of seen as, well, if the students fail out, they just couldn't hack it. They should just fail out. Um, and there's become an increasing recognition that, no, actually, in a lot of cases, there are students who could be very successful, but they maybe just didn't fit sort of that very narrow approach to learning and understanding that had been traditionally pushed. And let's face it, that had been oriented toward a fairly elite, um, fairly white uh, wealthy background, predominantly male. Um, and there are a lot of different ways of learning and knowing and growing that can be experienced in higher education, um, which I'm, is, yeah. is part of why as a society, we've, we've really pushed people in the direction, right? We're, we're teaching people how to think in this field. Yeah. Um, well, I love hearing the different vision you're casting, saying like, this is what our classrooms could look like. And this is how we could begin to view our students, not as sort of a, a group of people to sort, to see who can make it and who can't, but to see them as this dynamic group of people who we can begin to tailor our pedagogy to, bring them all in, get them excited, but we're, we're excited about it. Um, can you, you've mentioned UDL and you've given us some, some examples of that, but the flipped classroom you mentioned briefly, can you give an example of what a flipped classroom might look like in a STEM field? Yeah, so um, an example of a flipped classroom um, 
so I'll use an example actually coming out of computer science. Um, so it used to be that in computer science, one of the baseline things that students have to learn is rudimentary coding. Um, and that's a whole thing that's under discussion right now with generative artificial intelligence, but they're still pretty strongly within um, the computer science field, the expectation that students will learn basic coding skills as one of their like foundational pieces of the curriculum. So one of the things that used to happen is that you would go into a classroom and the professor would talk students through like, here is what the basic code to do this kind of operation looks like. And here is how you structure this code. Um, in a flipped classroom model, what you would do is you would actually have students watch maybe a video that walks them through what that baseline code is and how they would structure it. And then the expectation would be in the classroom environment, what they would do is they would come in and they would get some usually structured activities where they would have to then practice what that what had already been introduced to them through that video um, and see they would get sort of like practice-based practical application questions. So it might be something like um, your boss has just come to you and asked you to build a, you know, a new app um, that, that will do this thing. Um, and your job is to figure out what the code would be that would do that um, so that you have the chance to actually apply whatever the concept was that you're learning. Um, and I think one of the big challenges that we're dealing with right now in higher education, and I think is an overall question just for work life, for education life, um, you know, the presence of things like generative artificial intelligence. I think there's really a question, a lot of what that technology is able to do is to fulfill a lot of that really sort of foundational work. The reason in higher education we have you do that foundational work is because we want you to understand that so then we can build on it for more advanced concepts. Um, and so I think there's a real challenge conversation you know issue going on right now that we've really only been dealing with for the past nine or ten months um in any intensive way where we're looking at it and going well you know what do we do if there's sort of this gap between people's foundational understanding or people are filling in foundational understanding using technology how do we how do we actually structure learning experiences so we can take advantage of the technology, but also have enough understanding of what that technology is doing to be able to build upon it with that, you know, sort of innate human critical thinking quality beyond that. So it's I'm, an interesting time to be in higher well, this education. Is what I said to my students, I said, guys, like you need to be excited about being around when there's a paradigm shift. Because when I started teacher's college, you know, we were talking about the internet and what does this mean for us teaching humanities? And now it's, what does this mean for us being researchers when generative AI can do that research? And do we become some sort of broker of knowledge where we begin to add the human element, ask the moral questions related to what that generative AI produces? Um, so I love hearing you apply it to computer science, which as we know, all, uh, the advantages for coding with um, generative AI are significant, but it yeah. requires people who have a foundational knowledge to be able to manipulate that AI yeah. in, in a most effective way. So very interesting conversations. Thank you for walking through the flipped classroom. Um, in my own experience going through COVID, when I began to put my lectures online for the first time, I actually began to really enjoy my classroom time afterwards because we could go deeper. So they'd already watched the static content. They'd seen me talk, do the information dump and this sort of stuff that we're doing. So this is much more conversational. Um, but I'd been able to give them the information. And when they came to class, then we could ask questions. We could apply it. We could do some, some brainstorming activities related to it. Um, so the flipped classroom for me has been quite transformative in my own practice. I really, really value that. So the last question I have for you then, um, before we get going, is this question of disciplinary divides. Um, 
are you seeing people talk across these disciplinary divides or are we still seeing sort of silos where the philosophy students are getting to be all creative over here and the and the students in the STEM subjects are doing their giant exams and, and stressing out? Um, how, how, yeah, how significant and how definitive are those disciplinary divides and what hope is there for us? Yeah, so what I would say is that I think this is true of the future of teaching and learning and the future of research. Both are interdisciplinary. Um, and one of the things that I very much see from my vantage point as, um, as a librarian, um, but also just somebody who has been very involved in teaching and learning in higher education for a long time, is that the divides between different disciplines are becoming weaker and weaker over time. And there is an increasing acknowledgement, even in STEM workplaces, um, that this really heavy focus on STEM learning that has become it's kind of overtaken a lot of the K through 12 sector in the past 10 years, maybe 15 years, um, that, that STEM learning really needs to be tempered by conversations of the ethics of some of these things and asking sort of the very human questions, right? It's not enough to just figure out that you can do something. It's really important on its, from a technical perspective. It's really important to ask, you know, why are we doing that? What kind of impact is that going to have on humans, right? And is this the right sort of thing to doing to to be doing? And then there are sort of ethical questions about like, okay, something like the self-driving car is a great example, right? From an ethical perspective in the sense that a self-driving car is never going to be a fatigued person driving or an impaired person driving, right? It's always going to be something that's driving that from that perspective is safe. So that makes it more ethical. However, if something happens that's unexpected, right? An accident happens, somebody is killed. Who is responsible for that? Who is culpable for that? Um, and is it the company? Is it the person who is traveling in the car, right? Is it somebody who did something unexpected that caused the accident, right? And these are all different sorts of things that STEM fields, for example, are never really going to come to the place where they answer. Um, and we really derive a lot of benefit both in how we learn and think about things, but also just how we engage with and approach the world if we are able to understand and take a variety of perspectives. And I think that that's part of really why we see research moving in, in the interdisciplinary direction. And it has been for some period of time, but that has really accelerated in the past five to seven years, um, that focus on interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary research. Um, and what I would say in higher education, you know, that perspective of working at a larger research institution, it, it's not just because I work at a large research institution, but a lot of what I've seen in my time in higher education is that the research goes in a direction and then the teaching and learning follows that. So when we see research moving so heavily in that interdisciplinary direction, it's not surprising that teaching, in fact, is moving in a more interdisciplinary direction. Um, and I think one of the big questions for me um, is what will the models, like the actual approaches to teaching look like as we start to grapple with and understand this interdisciplinarity? Because traditionally, one of the big ways that we've approached this is with co-teaching relationships and approaches, but that's 
really expensive <laughs> for the higher education sector um, because you're paying two faculty members to be teaching the same course. Um, and I think there are some interesting questions about the extent to which technology maybe offers some opportunity to do that in more cost effective ways. Um, and I think that there are real questions around things like micro credentials and the extent to which that might offer some more flexibility in learning environments to engage with concepts in a little bit more of an interdisciplinary fashion. So it's hard to say we're really on the precipice. Of, I know we're seeing so much change yeah. so rapidly, partially COVID. And then who, who knew that we wouldn't be talking about COVID as much as we're talking about AI this fall. Didn't see that coming. Right. So <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely not. You know, I, I remember, um, one of the things that I do in my role is I sit on a small campus team that yeah. that helps coordinate teaching and learning supports and directions for the campus. Um, and I remember early December last year sitting in a meeting and somebody bringing up generative AI and like, do we need to be concerned about this just as we've, you know, sort of Whew, gotten through the worst of the pandemic yeah. and um you know that's when we started working on it oh yeah it was like the 4th of December in that yeah. meeting <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and the work continues but yeah we're we're definitely in a period of rapid change within higher education and it, that I think is always a little bit frightening or intimidating for people um, because you don't know the direction it's going to take. But one of the exciting things is that um, as somebody with a background in education, I actually think people in education or with the background in education are probably best positioned to weather the storm of this because there are still always going to be humans, yeah. right? Humans are always going to be learning. Yeah. And so all of these challenges that we're dealing with and changes that we're dealing with, they don't change some of those sort of core concepts yeah. or ideas of what we're interested in within the field of education. So it, it really positions us um, well to weather whatever today's storm and tomorrow's storm will happen to be. And, and I really, really appreciate you ending on that note because the students who are watching this are in their first semesters of their master's in higher education. And so our goal, our vision for them is that they can be the commentators on this, the leaders through this, the ones who can analyze this. And so instead of saying, oh, all this change is happening, the university is, you know, falling to pieces. So it's not. <laughs> um, you've They've learned the history of education. They've seen that there are different phases, different eras of what the university is meant to be. And now here they are at a time where they get to be the ones to analyze it, to um, make a vision to go forward. And so I hope that you've really enjoyed um, Carrie's insight into teaching and learning, the changes that are happening, how we could be student focused, some of the really innovative changes to pedagogy that are helping us to make our classroom spaces where students' voices are, are, are listened to. Um, and I wanna see what resonates with you. So Carrie's gonna be our guest speaker. So come to class, come to our, uh, or don't really come to class, come to Zoom, um, come to our online tutorial, bring your questions for Carrie. Um, she'll be with us for an hour to answer those. And I'm really looking forward to that conversation. So Carrie, thank you for being here. And I look forward to having you in class. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me.